Greetings, everyone. This is Michael Nagler with another edition of the Nonviolence Report. And I'd like to start today with a professor, a colleague of mine, indirectly a distinguished professor of economics and co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute at UMass Amherst, because Robert Pollin, the professor in question, has developed a basic framework which is the same for all states through which they can reduce their carbon dioxide emissions by roughly half as of 2030 and get to a zero emissions economy by 2050. Those are the targets that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has uh, proposed. It has to be uh, conformed to by the entire global economy. And Professor Pollan has this to say, a critical and totally straightforward result of these state-level investments programs is that they will get this, create an abundance of jobs, like 40,000 in Washington State, 420,000 in California. And he concludes, this conclusion runs completely counter to the widespread, if not prevalent view, namely that you have to decide between uh, climate safety and jobs. And now, this is something that nonviolence theory would predict, that if you do the right thing, which is namely the nonviolent thing, uh, other aspects of the situation will fall into place. So another confirmation that nonviolence works. Now, I want to thank a former intern of ours, Nina Kufitz, for sending me the following item. There's an organization called Safer World, one, one word, Safer World. They were founded as an arms control group back in 1989 and soon discovered that they had to go deeper. In other words, moving from peacekeeping, where you just try to stop a conflict that's going on, to peace building, where you change the uh, structures of the society that cause the conflict in the first place. And so they state now to that quote, today, with headquarters in London and a presence in Brussels, Nairobi, Vienna, etc., etc., Safer World remains one of the world's leading organizations on conflict prevention thinking and practice. And here's something that they recently did, which is really striking. There were two communities, two villages in Yemen, which shared a water supply and got into a bitter conflict over that one well. It was extremely destructive. People were being killed, water lines were being torn up, and the women of both villages got together and helped to broker an end to that conflict. The reason that, that attracted me, uh, my attention, is this, of course, is something that was said of the Buddha, that his clan, the Shakyas, got into a dispute with another clan over the water of the river. The Buddha stepped in, held up a handful of clear water, and said to both parties, which is more precious, blood or water? They said, blood is much more precious than water, blessed one. And he, of course, replied, then let us not shed blood over water. So this is a very early example of what we call third-party intervention or unarmed civilian peacekeeping. And it is very, very nice to see a group of women implementing it today. Uh, also here in the U.S., in Maine, there was a $90 million natural gas project which activists have successfully stopped. And uh, recently, a report has come out saying that civil disobedience is the main reason for plummeting coal use in the USA. They found that the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign had the biggest impact, though they were not the only one. They put uh, public pressure on utilities and state and local politicians to close down coal-fired units. And it was found that when this was done, 
the unit's life expectancy dropped from 56, 50 to 60 years to over just two years. So this is an example of the first stage of conflict intervention. It did not have to go to satyagraha. It did not require uh, serious uh, risk. Uh, but sometimes you can head things off at that stage, the first phase of our conflict resolution or conflict escalation curve. Uh, and it's good to see that that one was wrapped up in that way. Going abroad now, there are protests going on in Haiti. They are against the dictatorship of Jovenel Moïse, and uh, he is carrying out kidnappings and so forth. And medical professionals in particular are ramping up their efforts after an attempted kidnapping and murder of a colleague. This is an example of blowback. You try to do something violent, and it ends up being the worse for your effort. So these medical professionals, they organized a two-day work stoppage on March 2nd and then a protest, tens of thousands of people hitting the streets on March 7th. And this will be, again, an interesting protest to monitor. We'll try to keep you up to speed on it. But now a grievous conflict ongoing, worsening, is, of course, the protests against the coup, the military coup by Tatmadaw. That's the name of the military in Myanmar. Uh, police have been firing directly into crowds, and this signals a further diversification of tactics. So one thing that's happening is they are no longer uh, showing up in very large groups and making themselves vulnerable. This is known as a conservative action instead of a dispersive action. They're putting up signboards instead of people. That's an interesting tactic. And uh, for another one, they're hanging out sarongs, which is the uh, garment that women wear, because there's a feeling among Myanmari men that they don't want to walk under those Sarangs. So this is a good example of using local indigenous practices to uh, divert or defuse, to some degree, conflict. But uh, more will have to be done. Other strategies will have to be uh, come up with. And indeed, more international community pressure will have to be exerted beyond the mere statements by Security Council and UN, and so forth, in order to get this one to stop. One hopes that it will stay nonviolent. As we've pointed out earlier, the protests were not always completely nonviolent. There was some throwing of Molotov cocktails, and as you know, all it takes is a little bit of violence to vitiate the effect of a nonviolent movement. So back home in the U.S., just for a second before I move on to resources, there are several organizations in Chicago that are collaborating. This is the kind of development we like to see. Organizations that do roughly the same thing on the same issue are joining forces. And in this case, they're offering free bystander intervention trainings in order to interrupt hate crimes. And uh, this with a focus on protecting Asian and Muslim Americans. The interesting thing about this event is that it made it onto the mainstream news. So this is just a thumbnail of the many nonviolent events at various stages of development and sophistication that are going on in the world. One extraordinarily rich development now is the development of trainings and resources. And I'd like to start by mentioning a couple coming up very soon that uh, META Peace Team, this is META with one T, is co are coordinating. One is uh, Thursday, March 18th. It may have already been passed if you are hearing this on Friday, but it will probably be recorded or will have been recorded. And that was a lunchtime nonviolence skills practice session that they're doing with us, META with one T and META with two Ts, at 12 to 1 uh, Pacific time. That you, you find it through META Peace Team. 
And also on the 20th, they are going to have a community screening of our film, The Third Harmony, and that will be at 4 p.m. Pacific time. The International Center on Nonviolent Conflict is offering a free webinar with our good friend Michael Beer on the 24th. Michael is the executive director of Nonviolence International there in Washington. And this webinar will be uh, a groundbreaking new study called Civil Resistance Tactics in the 21st Century. That will be noon to 1 Eastern Time on the 24th. And that should be very, very rewarding. Meanwhile, Campaign Nonviolence, uh, an effort organized by Pace Bene, has offered not one, not two, but six new trainings to help us live a nonviolent life. I want to mention a couple of legislative actions that we should be aware of. The House of Representatives is being presented with a bill that will extend the draft to women. This is a complex dilemma because, uh, on the one hand, we want to have an equality of opportunity between men and women, but we certainly didn't want that opportunity to go in a violent direction. And one of the church fathers, I believe it was Tertullian, said we do not allow women into war because we don't even want to train men into war. So uh, Congress is likely to vote this year on extending or expanding draft registration to women as well as men. And it may do so by including this in the annual national security authorization, something we should be alert to. Meanwhile, there is a bill uh, banning assault weapons and large capacity ammunition magazines that, of course, became possible with the new presidency. That would be something to support. The Peace Alliance also, which is the organization that is working on getting a Department of Peace established in the U.S. government. That's an effort that's been going on for about 200 years. Uh, they are, are offering now five webinars in the coming week, mostly by a group called Mediators Beyond Borders. And Scylla Elworthy, who became very well known by her, with her book and her effort called A Business Plan for Peace, doing something very desirable, which is combining the efficiency of corporations and organizations uh, of that kind with the values of the peace movement. So now they have courses uh, called Mighty Heart Courses, and they will be starting over a 10-week period uh, at the end of this month and continuing every Tuesday from the UK. Happy to say that an important resource that we're always referring people to at Swarthmore, Swarthmore College, the Global Nonviolent Action Database, GNAD has just gotten a makeover. And that's something we should all look at and celebrate and recirculate. Want to mention also that Waging Nonviolence has presented a study, a very long, very informative article on how D.C. peace teams, that is Washington, D.C. peace teams under the direction of Eli McCarthy, has uh, not only mounted a presence in Washington, D.C., from Election Day to Inauguration Day, and they have stated that the very act of being present is often enough to de-escalate and defuse constructive conflict. But when that is not enough, the group does interposition by stepping physically between people. And DC Peace Teams has done a superb job of monitoring uh, what the results of all of their interventions were. And they have some incredible stories for you on waging nonviolence. You can find them on our page Meta 2021, but the article will be called D.C. Peace Team Community Protection During Election-Related Demonstrations, and there are three or four quite dramatic stories of how they had to do 
a last-minute interposition that were successful in staving off what could have been violent and conceivably fatal conflicts. And I just want to conclude, although there are so many more trainings and resources coming online, which we will be catching you up on as time goes on, I want to conclude with a story about a Japanese individual named Sakai Kato. He was living near the Fukushima plant, and while 160,000 people evacuated the area, he had the job of um, taking down some uh, condemned buildings, and he decided to stay because he saw pet pets, mainly cats, that were abandoned in those buildings. And he said, I don't want to leave. I want to stay on this land that my family has owned for three generations. I like living in these mountains. But his main reason for staying behind was to take care of those pets. And he's now looking after 41 cats. Um, and so that, uh, that really does count as a nonviolent effort. And I want to salute Mr. Cato by way of ending up our nonviolence report for this week. Thank you very much for listening. 